Dr. Justin Marcajati here with Evan Brand. Today we're going to be chatting all about gut issues and how they can make you tired. Evan, how are we doing today, man? What's going on? Hey, I'm doing well. I was tired when I had gut issues, but I was anxious yeah. too. So if you missed the last podcast, check mm -hmm. that one out because it was about gut anxiety connection. I would encourage you before you get on anti-anxiety meds, get your gut looked at. But today is about fatigue, being tired, physical. This could be mental too. So uh, hopefully you and I will break that apart because when people say tired, what do you automatically think? Uh, I think like they just want to sit on the couch, but this mental fatigue, this mental tiredness, that's a problem because if you have kids, you got to be on your, your best game. If you're an entrepreneur, you got to be on your best game. Mm -hmm. So if you have mental or physical, it, it's, it's literally affecting your income if you're tired. So hundred percent, hundred percent fatigue. This, this mm -hmm. podcast, we can market it is literally this episode may help you make more money. Absolutely. So when you look at the gut, we can, can we can kind of put the gut in the middle and we connect it to the different energy systems in the body. So we can look at out of the gate adrenals. Right. The adrenals are important because they produce cortisol in a circadian fashion. Cortisol is a glucocorticosteroid. Take a big word, you break it down. Gluco meaning it pertains to blood sugar and energy. So, And also the end part is corticosteroid, which means it's an anti-inflammatory. So let's break that up. So the more stressed and the more inflamed you are, you're going to deplete cortisol. And if you deplete cortisol because you're stressed and inflamed, that can also decrease the gluco part, which is going to help with blood sugar and energy. It's part of the reason why like when, you know, your doctor puts you on like prednisone or a corticosteroid because you're inflamed, you may notice your blood sugar go up, right? Like they'll say diabetes and you'll, you may notice you get a little bit of a jittery jump in energy if you take it too late because it pertains to energy and your sugar. And when your body has lots of sugar flowing through it, unless you're very insulin resistant, that tends to give people a little bit more energy because that fuel is right in their bloodstream ready to go. Again, if you're insulin resistant, it's a little different because it's harder to, um, your body's more going to be a sugar burner and will be storing that sugar if you um, aren't burning it. And so if you're tired already and that sugar is going through you and you're not burning it, guess where it's going? It's going right to your fat cells. So the first connection is the adrenals. And then obviously the thyroid can kind of plug in there too, because your thyroid controls your overall metabolic activity. So if you're tired because you know, your thyroid's low, you may also be cold, fatigued, have per poor circulation as well, hair growth, poor nails and skin. And so we have the thyroid and the adrenals. And of course, different nutrients play a major role with the thyroid. And also most thyroid issues are autoimmune in nature. And guess where 80% of the immune system is? We can plug that back to the gut. And so if we have autoimmune stuff, we have to look at the gut. And then so we have adrenals, we have thyroid. The last area would be the mitochondria and all the nutrients that plug into that. B vitamins and carnitine and CoQ10 and a lot of the nutrients that are so important, B vitamins, play a big role with that. And we can kind of go into each system more in depth, but I just wanted to lay that, those things out. Yeah. Heck yeah. And then also we'll layer in the, the malabsorption piece. We'll get into that soon, but thyroid, if you could only pick one marker to run on thyroid, what would you pick? Like, well, like I, if, if somebody says, Hey, you're only allowed one biomarker to look at thyroid. Cause as you know, conventional endocrinology, it's TSH and that's it. And that sucks. Yeah. I mean, if I only could run one, I would run at least T3. Because yeah, T3, that's, is, that's the major metabolic component there. Now, it's nice to see thyroid antibodies because that's going to tell me, is there an autoimmune component? How bad is it? And that gives me the ammo to say, okay, we got to look at the gut. Maybe there's an infection, H. pylori, fungal overgrowth, parasites. Um, maybe that's all driving gut permeability. Um, of course, that gives me the, per the, the ability to make more drastic, strict diet changes, going full autoimmune paleo. You know, it's good to know that, but I always come into any thyroid case assuming there is autoimmunity no matter what. That way I can never mess up and be too lenient on someone's diet. But I'll also come in there and just look at a basal temperature. I'll just go have someone get a fertility thermometer off of Amazon and we'll check their first morning body temperature and see where it sits because low body temperature gives you a kind of an indirect window into someone's metabolism as well. And how low are you talking? When are you like, oh, something's there? Well, I mean, I like to look, you know, 97.8 to 98.2 for axillary. That's your armpit. And then 98.2 to 98.6 for your mouth. And that gives you a pretty good window where you're at. Do it first part of the morning before you even get out of bed. That way, it's just, you, get, you kind of have a resting metabolic window. You're not up and at them or, you know, getting out of the covers and then cooling off. So it gives you a pretty good window what's happening under the hood there. Cool. That's neat. Yeah. So get a full thyroid panel looked at if you're fatigued. That's going to be easy. And I mean... 
you're talking maybe 200 bucks to do a really good blood panel. Like blood's not that expensive. 100%. Not that much at all. So that's nice to look at. And then if we see the aberrations in temperature, like usually more than a 0.3 degree Fahrenheit or more in regards to the temperature from one day to the other, that tends to mean there's a lot of adrenal issues. So we can have this up and down aberration. So if it's low, let's say below 97, 8, maybe like let's say it's in the 90, upper 96s, and then the temperature is also bumping around but still low, then there, that kind of gives me a window that there's probably some thyroid and adrenal issues going on. So it's nice to look at both. Yeah, well said. Okay, so do you want to talk about solutions for it yet or do you want to just run through the rest? I think let's – so we talked about the adrenals and just really important because the adrenals also kind of kick into other things because – you have a circadian rhythm with your adrenals and cortisol is produced at a certain time frame in the morning, higher, and then lower throughout the day. And so if the adrenals start to become an issue and become stressed because of inflammation, because of chronic stress, emotional or chronic nutritional stress or toxicity, that's going to throw off the circadian rhythm potentially and create this HPA axis issue and maybe cause a reverse cortisol pattern where the cortisol maybe starts to go up at night and that can impair sleep. And then also, if we don't get good sleep, then that also compounds more fatigue, right? So you can see how like you start with the adrenals, but then if that goes off, that can spiral into sleep, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was there. I had insomnia, but then I'd be drained during the day. So I'd be tired and wired at night and then, you know, just not not functioning well during the daytime. And I had a lot of gut issues. So it definitely yeah. added up. At the time, I was using adaptogenic herbs, but it definitely couldn't get me fully out of the woods. I was using maca, tribulus, rhodiola all sorts of different ginsengs, ashwagandha can help, did some magnolia for a while, throwing in GABA to try to calm the nervous system. So I used a lot of the adaptogens, but if you stop there, you're really not going to get fully out of the woods because I still had these different gut issues. Bingo. Yeah. So it's good to look at, you know, kind of everything holistically. And then not to mention, we talked about the sleep rhythm, but if we're chronically inflamed, that's also a big one too, because chronic inflammation is going to cause a lot more immune activity, more cytokines, more interleukins. And if there's like kind of autoimmune stuff happening going on, that can create more inflammation. And there's kind of this correlation where the more cytokines and interleukins that are present, that's also can drive fatigue. And think about it, right? If your immune system is so overactive because it sees what's happening as a stressor, that imagine you only have so much energy to pull from with your body to run your different systems. And if your immune system is overactive, cytokines, interleukins, these chemical messengers due to inflammation, that's going to pull from all of the energy you have to run your body systems as a whole. So that in and of itself can make you fatigued. Same thing, you have these same kind of cytokines, interleukins present when you get sick, when you get a virus or a bacterial infection. And what's the hallmark that happens when you get sick is you get tired. You get tired because your body wants you to be like, hey, lay up, stop doing stuff so we can fight the infection. And so that's a big one too with inflammation, cytokines, immune, and then also fatigue. Yeah. Speaking of uh, cytokines and uh, all of that, there is a paper that just came out relatively recent. This was looking at post-CV19 mm. patients. Yeah. So- even one, but even two years after infection, there's still massive, massive fatigue happening in people. So this study breaks it down further, but the long story short of it is if you feel like you never fully recovered, you got the virus, you never fully recovered, you still have fatigue. Well, they're, they're seeing even after two years, that's still happening. And when you mentioned cytokines, you and I have seen uh, you can measure some of this on blood, and then also you can measure the mitochondrial impact on the organic acids. And I know because I've seen people either during infection or right after infection, we've looked at their oat test, and there's a massive change. We see a change in nutrient levels. We see a change even in the stool test in terms of gut inflammation, intestinal permeability markers. And so this is another factor that we have to throw in. And you can use herbal antivirals. Uh, I don't know uh, what the latest is on the, the word. So we'll say IVM, the IVM, the, the yeah. interview that I did with uh, Pierre Corey. That should tell you everything you need to know. But uh, I'm still implementing some of these tools to, to get people out of this fatigue hole. Yeah. And so what's the mechanism of that? And so the mechanism of that, I, my thinking is you have this um, 
spike amino acid. We'll call it that just for sake of uh, conversation, this amino acid that has a spike component to it. And when that's floating around for prolonged periods of time, most times when people have that type of sp spike amino acid, it's cleared through the body, through different mechanisms. And so what you're finding in a lot of these chronic fat fatigue people is this spike amino acid is hanging out in that bloodstream way longer. And there's a difficult, it's difficult for the body to eliminate some of those spike amino acids. And so some of the things that can be done is N-acetylcysteine that can lower the load of that. And then using these amino acid compounds, I'm sorry, uh, these enzyme compounds like serapeptidase, like natokinase, um, I would even say like um, these high dose bromelain or pancreatic enzyme compounds on an empty stomach can start to break some of these spike amino acids down. And that's going to decrease, in my opinion, some of the immune stress and so that, that's a good thing to look at there out of the gate. And I think also modulating your oxidative stress pathways, i.e. via glut glutathione, and that can be done with glutathione exogenously, or it can be done endogenously via N-acetylcysteine in your body helping to make it. And then I would look at things like vitamin D and things that plug into the mitochondria, things like CoQ10, things like NADH, nicotinamide, adenosine, dinucleotide, NAD, NADH+. Plus. These are good compounds. I like... Um, creatine or carnitine or ribose, things that plug into these energy pathways to support the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, mitochondria function as well. Yeah. I mean, there's probably a billion people suffering. I mean, if you look at the numbers of infection, you look at the percentages, if you kind of extrapolate these studies and you look at the percentages of people suffering still one, two years later, it, it would probably sum to a billion plus people worldwide. So this is a massive problem that's also leading to long-term brain fog. So it's a whole tangent for another show. We could do like a, yep. a like a long haul show if you'd like. I did one on yep. my own, like a solo, and it got pretty well received. But but um, let's let's go back to the gut. I just wanted to point that out though, because mm -hmm. that that paper kind of came across my desk, and I thought, man, this is crazy. Think about the brain fog, the fatigue, the infertility, the hormone disruption, the joint issues, the heart issues, POTS, long-term POTS. So, so that's playing into the fatigue as well too, right? Some of these people are exhausted and then when they try to exercise, now their blood pressure and or their heart rate is going up. So now they're afraid. So now they're tired, but then they get a personal trainer or something, they go for a run and now they have all this POTS. So if you're, yep. if you're adding in mitochondrial support nutrients, like you mentioned, well, then I may also throw in the adaptogens, but then we also may throw in some heart support too. Like I love doing some motherwort tincture. Uh, it's one of my favorite herbs. I literally, I don't know if you know this, but I literally have a bottle of motherwort in the car. So everywhere I go, mm. I have this little stash bag. I have some homeopathics and then I have some motherwort tincture in there. Just like if I have a, a crazy reaction to something, heart's racing, you get in a car wreck, who knows? You never know when this might need to come into play. Uh, motherwort's great for emotional things. So grief, trauma, um, anxiety, but massively helpful for fatigue and POTS to stabilize the heart rhythm. So if you're someone who, let's say you're out at the grocery store and you know, this is a true true story, but you know I have clients who they're, they're worried they can't shop because they're so tired that they don't think they can get through the entire grocery store experience. Mm. I'll tell them, hey, take five drops of motherwort before you go in and that'll prevent you from getting into this POTS episode where you feel like you're going to faint, you feel woozy, you feel lightheaded. I don't want you doing that. So obviously keep them on the mitochondrial stuff, the adrenal stuff, make sure you had stable blood sugar, and then let's integrate some of the heart herbs. So maybe we throw in some Hawthorne as well mm -hmm. to try to help the heart out. That tends to be really good. And then ultimately, I, th I think also you have to integrate the brain into this fatigue piece too, because uh, I interviewed the guy Ashok Gupta yep. to talk about the brain retraining. Yep. And what I've noticed is if you can get people doing some sort of like a compassion, gratitude, contentment type meditation, and they're essentially just turning off the sympathetic, I find the fatigue actually can go away. So it's almost as if the fatigue is a protective mechanism. Like you've been running from this invisible bear, this threat, the virus, the gut pathogen, whatever it is, it's almost like the body wants to slow you down. But then just by simply... Mm, we'll just call it downshifting the nervous system, yep. all of a sudden you have energy. And it doesn't make sense because essentially you're just sitting still focusing on your breathing. You're, you're going to your happy place and all of a sudden you have energy from that. It sounds counterintuitive. Oh, I agree. I mean, I think what happens is the nervous system is trying to put you in a place where it can consolidate energy so it can work on healing. And then the first time someone starts to develop a little bit of energy, they're like, oh, I need to go out and do this and do that now. It's like, well, no, 
That's like saying you have this like ten thousand dollars in debt. You finally put up an extra one to two thousand in your emergency fund on your way to ten thousand, and you're like, well, let's just spend it all. Well, it's like that's not you know you have to kind of accumulate that and not fritter that energy or fritter the the money away that's extra. Yeah. And so people have to look at that um, in that kind of context. And I think in, in Ashab Gupta's work, he's talking about like the amygdala and that fight or flight response. And these people that have that overactive amygdala, that overactive brainstem, these are the ones that are just sensitive to everything, the smallest stress, every supplement, every food. And getting that kind of brainstem fight or flight response calmed down is essential so they can actually add in new foods, add in supplements, which then helps support your physiology and healing. Yeah, I mean, you saw me go through it. It was not fun. So uh, mm -hmm. luckily, I'm in a much, much better place now. Ketamine really helped me too. I've done probably eight, maybe nine hours worth of ketamine. That really turned off. When was like, this? That's news to me. I didn't know that. Yeah, did I not tell you about it? No, you didn't tell oh, me about man. it. Oh, man. So it's amazing. Well, there was a, a local clinic here. They have several different, they might even have one up near you. I'll have to check. I think it's worth yeah. you, you know, experimenting with it because it turns down inflammation so much. Like your brain is so clear afterwards. And there's a lot of cool papers on uh, PTSD, all sorts of trauma, anxiety, depression. Uh, but in Neil Nathan's toxic book about mold, he gave a whole, actually it was another doctor wrote a segment about ketamine. I thought, well, I should try this. It turned down my chemical sensitivity by at least half, mm, like maybe even 60 or 70%, I think just via the, the inflammation reduction. Now this sounds like a tangent for fatigue, but, uh, it's because the limbic system is so dysregulated when you have toxins. So if there's gut infections, mold, Lyme, Bartonella, all the stuff I'd been through, when your nervous system gets stuck like that, that also causes fatigue. So for me, after the session, this is done via IV. So there's mm. one hour sessions and then I did a two hour. The two hour was incredible. I was very, very deep. And you're still, um, you're still aware. So you, you can still talk. I mean, you could have a perfectly flowing conversation just like we're doing now, but it's definitely hallucinogenic at that dose. So uh, uh, I was like 60 to 70 milligrams per hour. So it ended up being about 120 to 140 milligrams for two hours. And then when you come out of it, I mean, you feel like you could take over the world. You're a little nauseous, a little dizzy, but once it gets out of your system, you feel totally rejuvenated. Like you could literally do a high jump eight feet in the air. Yeah. I know it's used in anesthesia, in the anesthesia world. And I know they use it in like horse anesthesia as well. I mean, I, I look at a lot of that. I see it kind of have, having palliative benefits. I'm not sure how much it addresses the root cause of what's going on, but if it can give you that edge to move in the right direction, um, while you incorporate other good things, I, I think that can be a help, helpful thing. Helpful. Yeah. Get, yeah. Get you unstuck, get you yeah. unstuck. So I'll probably go back soon and do another one. I just, the nausea is kind of hard. So what I ended up doing was taking uh, a ginger beforehand yeah. and then doing a ginger after, and then doing uh, some Berber panella after to try to clear out the brain. Cause you're a little, a little fog, a little like kind of foggy. And I don't even call right. it foggy. Your mind's clear, but your body's a little woozy from it. It is a drug. I mean, it's not, oh, yeah. it's not, it's not natural. Yeah, but, I mean, it's, it's an anesthetic. That's why I always like to draw a line when people talk about things like, is this getting to the root cause? Like, do you have a ayahuasca or a LSD or a microdose of mushroom mm -hmm. type of deficiency? I mean, I can see the benefits of it modulating the stress response, maybe improving pers you know, perspective on what's going on, maybe helping to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. But we got to make sure other things are in place to promote healing. And I, I know, obviously, you're checking all those boxes off, so that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for example, like there was a, a firefighter that came in and this guy was doing an eight hour session. Imagine right. being on that for eight hours yeah. uh, and he had chronic pain, chronic fatigue, et cetera. And it's like, well, this guy needs detox. And so I told the clinic, I'm like, Hey, and they've actually referred some people to me since I was like, Hey, this guy, I mean, ketamine might help his pain and all that, but he's got chronic fatigue as well because he's so toxic because he's been in burning buildings, breathing oh, in toxins. All I mean, the VOC and who knows asbestos or other types of plastic compounds, you know, if it's an old building, it could have lead in the paint. It's all going to be aerosolized. I mean, it's just a lot of toxins there for sure. So I'd like to just call out some of the occupations that may be suffering from this. This could be anything from yeah. teachers, uh, pilots, mm -hmm. librarians yep. working around a lot of moldy books. You could say first responders of any kind. So EMS, oh, yeah. police, fire, uh, any of you guys could be exposed to different toxins that then affect your ability to make cellular energy. So if you're a, a chronic fatigue person in the military, you know, there's a lot of issues there, whether it's injections they're getting or chemical exposures, jet fuel. I mean, I've worked with some pilots. Those guys are off the charts toxic in terms of jet fuel, gasoline additives, all sorts of things. So uh, it's, 
it, it's sad because the, the people we look up to the most, they end up being the, the most toxic, the most yeah. affected. And first thing we can do on that, we can use infrared sauna to help detoxify out our skin and or into our gut. Uh, we can use N-acetylcysteine and glutathione and, and different B vitamins and sulfur amino acids to run our phase one, phase two detoxification. We can just make sure we're drinking really good, clean, enriched mineral water during the day. The solution to pollution is dilution. That's super important. Just get the inflammation down in our body, right, with the foods and getting all the junky excess omega-6 linoleic acids from processed vegetable oils, get more healthy saturated fats, more healthy mono unsaturated plant fats as well, coconut, or coconut's more saturated, but olive and avocado are going to be on the mono saturated side. Those are all good options for you for sure. Macadamia is, uh, Mercola had a great article the other day that was looking at all the different fat contents and different oils yep. and seeds and yep. macadamia is like your best bet. So if you're, if you're eating like grass fed butter, ghee, tallow, the next one up on the list, it's still going to be really, really low is going to be macadamia. So good, good quality in terms of fat. I love some, some macadamias, you know, put a little bit of salt on those bad boys and that's a great snack. All you need is a handful or two and you're, you're good. You're satiated. Love that. I'm going to make sure I pull that one up. That's awesome. Love it. Um, there was a question that came in from John. We could hit it because we hit on adrenals. The question was about the Dutch test. Does it show the fatigue caused by chronic gut problems? And you alluded in the beginning about adrenals. So that would be something we would use. Yeah, we would look at, the, so the question again was, yeah. So yeah, it would give us a good window into some of the nutrients that could be at play on the Dutch Complete. It would tell us about that. If there's a lot of chronic depleted cortisol or overly high or rhythm issues, then we look at all the physical, chemical, and emotional stressors. We look at the gut. We look at everything. So I would never expect the Dutch to tell me the complete story, but it would give me a really good, important piece. And it would tell me kind of other directions to look at. And of course, you know, you combine that with a good health history, you're going to be able to know what's going on. We, we kind of alluded to gut infections, but we didn't break them down. Why don't we break them down real quick? Yeah. So, uh, yep. H, H pylori, infamous fatigue, uh, thing. I mean, for me, it was fatigue. It was, it was depression. It was anxiety. It was skin issues. My sleep was terrible. Like H pylori, I really, really took a, took a number, uh, took a toll on me. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you pushing me through to, to get that fixed because you were kind of hitting it over the head. Like, Hey, there's gotta be more gut, more gut, more gut. And there it was, there was the H pylori. And then also the, the parasites, parasites are going to make you tired as well. You don't have to travel to some exotic location to get parasites. There's many, many yep. people like me living in the U S where I've had parasites from freshwater lakes, rivers, creeks, streams, doing all the fun outdoor stuff I like to do. You're going to get exposed to these things. So if they take residence, you're going to have fatigue from that. And you just have to pay attention. Like if you have diarrhea and fatigue, there's probably something there. If you have skin issues and fatigue, you got to start thinking gut, gut, gut. Don't just take the Accutane. Don't just take the caffeine or the coffee or the Adderall or the Vivance or some other like methamphetamine derivative stimulant medication. You can fix this. Uh, so quick story. And then, uh, and then I want you to riff on the gut piece too, but yeah, uh, our kids are going to swim lessons and there was a, another mom there who was talking to me about her kids and how they went to this summer camp. And it, this was like kind of off the grid, like in the woods uh, camp that she took her kids to. And she said, you would not believe the medication line. So you're talking kids like ages maybe 8 to 12 or 8 to 14 or so. And she said the medication line for all these children was like a mile long. I'm like, my God, is that what we've become now? Like she was one of the, the only parents who had an unmedicated kid. That's, that's scary. Oh, I see it all the time with my, with my kids and you know the nutrition that I see um, other kids their age have. My kids will eat, you know, good quality bacon or sausage or eggs in the morning. They get good supplementation. They get, you know, if they do a smoothie, it's coconut milk with collagen. I mean, we try to really be on point with their blood sugar and their good fats and good proteins. Um, but if you're just, most kids don't get really good proteins or good, um, good fats at all. And so they just, they go from blood sugar swing to blood sugar swing, which has major effects on cognitive function and mood and behavior. I mean, my kids are already hard enough. They're strong willed enough to deal with. And anytime we let them have too much sugar, it's like, okay, this is what it would be like every day if we were on top of things. Oh, I know. And do you, do you notice that out in public too? Like, I don't know, grocery store, church, just random public places. Do you notice, uh, seeing fatigued children? Cause it's hard for me and I'm sure for you too, as a practitioner, it's hard for me not to want to help everybody. Cause like I saw a kid yesterday, this girl, she was maybe six or seven, cute little blonde girl. She kind of looked like my daughter. And 
you could just see the fatigue in this girl. Dark circles under yeah. the eyes. The skin was pale. I'm like, God, this girl needs help. But, you know, I just like, ah, what am I going to do? I can't just stop everybody and start throwing probiotics at them. Yeah, I mean, the big issue I see is parents are kind of zombifying their kids with iPads. Yeah. And, and don't get me wrong, that that serves a, an important place. My wife and I went out to brunch yesterday, and it's like, okay, we have 30 minutes to, like, have a peaceful conversation and not be interrupted. So we pull out the iPad for 30 minutes, right? But everything else, it's like, all right, it's it's magnetiles, Legos, physical stuff, right? Go play baseball, go to a sport, play catch. So we try to keep the technology down to an absolute minimum and use that as kind of like a life preserver kind of when we need it for, for more for our little peace of mind. So we can, you know, have a conversation and not be interrupted. Any parent yeah. uh, listening can probably empathize, but yeah. So if you have these technology things with your kids, try to keep that down to a minimum, but um, that, it, it plays a big role because the more your blood sugar's off, guess what? When it goes up and down, you're going to be eating processed food, junky food, guess what that does to your microbiome? It's going to cause a lot of dysbiotic bacteria overgrowth because the bad bugs prefer the easy digest processed sugars. And so it's going to feed a lot of that bad stuff. And then the more those bad bugs are up, it's more likely to um, impact your endogenous nutritional supply, meaning bacteria in your gut, good bacteria provides nutrients. Bad bacteria actually adds more toxins, more lipopolysaccharides, more endotoxins. And so essentially bad bacteria is going to poop more toxin, excrete more toxin, while the good bacteria is going to excrete more nutrients. And so good bacteria plays a big role in having good endogenous nutrition supply. Yeah. And, and not to mention too, you're also helping to manufacture different vitamins in your gut. And if that gut is disrupted, you're literally not going to be producing adequate levels of your bees. And therefore you're going to be more fatigued. Your amino acids get thrown off if you're not eating or digesting your proteins well. This is not a rare problem. I know sometimes the stuff you and I talk about, it, it feels like it's, it, it feels like it's, uh, off the beaten path, but this is happening all day everywhere. It's just, people aren't recognizing it. They don't know where to start their kids tired. So they take them to the doctor and the doctor puts them on a stimulant so he can pay attention in school. Yeah. That's a problem because the problem with that is it's going to fry your adrenals. It's a methamphetamine. It's a pharmacal, uh, pharmaceutical version of meth. And we don't know what's going to happen to your kid's brain when they go through age seven to 15 or 20 on a methamphetamine, what it's going to do. There's, there's primate studies showing malformation of the brain, certain areas not developing like they should just keep it very general. Now, again, what does that mean in, in the regular population? All kinds of problems could happen. So it's always better off trying to get to the root cause, get the diet dialed in, get blood sugar dialed in and use nutrients in place of, of drugs. And also it's just, you know, the expectation that you're going to get a seven or eight year old boy to sit at a desk all day is probably an unrealistic expectation. So you could bring some of this conversation into a, a public schooling standpoint is like, how do we have wrong expectations, at least for boys, even girls too, girls tend to do a lot better at following instructions and sitting still compared to boys. But I mean, obviously you're going to have problems with kids as a whole. And just that, that whole parenting issue and, and schooling issue of kids being expected to sit there is going to lead to more of these medications that can impact stress and impact the gut too. Yeah. And, and this is all being compounded by mineral depletion yes. and lack of nutrients that's even accelerated since you and I were kids. I mean, if you look at Correct. like the latest USDA nutrient uh, panels where they study apples, I mean, the apple of 30, 40 years ago was better than the apple today if it, it's not, you know, loaded with, with pesticides. So yeah, um, yeah. So, I, so I had Joel South in my podcast that would test his farm raised pasture raised eggs against the conventional egg. And he said he had 20 times more folate in his eggs compared to the grocery store egg. I believe it. Well, luckily I'm seeing a lot of stuff now where you can get pretty much pasture raised on pasture, their entire life eggs at the grocery, even like not better. whole foods, like just your average Joe grocery. Now you can get pastured eggs. So, you know, hundred percent, hundred percent, which is good people, you know, companies will basically respond to people's desire and, and, and what their demands are. So I think it's good to keep on, keep on pushing that makes it easier for all of us to access good quality foods. So I think that's important. And I just wanted to highlight next thing I would say, um, on the gut side is just food intolerances. Just so many kids are getting exposed to grains, gluten, casein, dairy, um, processed sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and then the glyphosate residues that w are within those that cause more gut permeability, all of the food allergies, and then the glyphosate that compounds that because we know glyphosate's the major pesticide that makes up Roundup, 
right? It's a gly glycine molecule that chelates, and that is going to increase gut permeability. It's going to decrease the brush border, which is going to impact the absorption of nutrients in the small intestine. So all these things play a major role as well. And so you have the foods, you have the pesticide residue, then you have stress, and then you have all the bugs that you either get exposed to via the environment, water, poor food, or just through antibiotics. Just because you go to the MD with every little issue, they prescribe antibiotics like it's candy. And that creates dysbiosis because no one's coming in with probiotics to re-inoculate on the backside. Well, it's easy when you get afraid, right? And especially if you have kids too. Yeah. You see something wrong with your kid. You think, oh, they're kind of tired. They've got an earache. Mm, let's go get them. Their ear hurts. Let's get them in. It's going to be antibiotics, throw off the gut, and then the kid ends up fatigued. So hopefully people see the domino effect of complaint, visit to whoever, antibiotic, gut issues, mitochondrial issues, fatigue, yep. anxiety, depression. So that's literally how this cascade can happen. And yep. then you end up with several prescriptions because now you go to the psychiatrist for the anxiety and now you're on something for that too. But this all started from the antibiotic. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't take it if I was dying. I probably would. But luckily, knock on wood, uh, the herbal antibiotics have done so well for me with so many different issues in my Bingo. family, so many clients. I know between you and I both, we've got probably three, 4,000 clients now between us, if not more. And the herbals are incredible tools. So if there is dysbiosis, parasites, H. pylori, clostridia, pseudomonas, klebsiella, any of these kind of scary infections that you hear about, that you read about coming out of hospitals, you know, outbreak of pseudomonas, you see those things like outbreak of crypto at a swimming pool. It's like, yep. I, I don't get afraid by that. I mean, when I see that on a test result, I feel very happy that we found that in someone because now I know yep. how to fix it. And I know that they're going to have significant improvement in their fatigue, their sleep, their stress, their mood, their food sensitivities will even calm down if we can get that gut in better shape. Yeah, we were on the lake a few weeks ago and one of my kids got pink eye and we think because of the water, because of the probably the bacteria count in the water. And we were with a couple and they were like, oh, you have to go bring them to get antibiotics and all this. And we're like, no, we got this watch. And we just did uh, two days of cool little silver drops in his eyes, gone, cleared it right up. We texted Love back. That. We're like, no, it's all good. We just use cold little silver, nano silver compound. It's 99.9% .9 saline, and we just cleaned the eye out. No issues. Done. You know, my favorite, because we had that happen too. I don't know what it was from. Maybe school or you know how kids are. They're in the dirt. They don't They're, wash their hands, and they just yeah. touch their eyes, rub them. My favorite is this Opticare. I don't know if you've played with this one before. Homeopathic, or what is it? No, it's got honey in it. So it comes from India. I have to buy it directly from India. I can never find it locally. Mm. It's uh, honey and rose. It's mm. kind of it's kind of cool. I think that's it. I think it's literally just those two ingredients, honey and oh, rose. Cool. But nice. that thing, I mean, you're talking like, I got a pack of 10. I had to order it from, you know, a pack of 10 from India. I think it was like 20 bucks for 10 bottles of the stuff. So, uh, I mean, it, I need to start passing them out to people on the street corner. Like, hey, do you, I see yeah. you have red eyes. Like, here you go. Because it's, yeah. it's good stuff. Yeah, especially when you have palliative issues from, you know, rubbing your hands or from the environment or from like the water. It's, it's nice to be able to have something that's palliative, right? So I think yeah. that's good. Excellent. Well, just to kind of wrap things up, right? Just to kind of summarize on some of the big issues that we hit today, we have our adrenals, stress handling system. We have our thyroid, metabolic health, which a lot of that connects to the gut via autoimmune is most auto, most of our immune responses from the gut. I would say are having a disrupted microbiome, gut imbalances, whether it's dysbiosis, SIBO, you can throw parasites, H. pylori, fungal overgrowth in that. We have our circadian rhythm being off and sleep. Um, just kind of that chronic brainstem amygdala kind of response, having that overactive sympathetic nervous system response. We have food issues, food allergens, food stressors, right? The food sensitivities. And then we can kind of put nutritional deficiencies in that category, whether it's B vitamins or magnesium or um, carnitine or CoQ10 or different um, nutrients to help our, like ribose to help our mitochondrial system. And those are a good six or seven kind of steps that we have to make sure that we address so we have good energy through healthy gut function. Yeah, the amino acids too for the brain. Tyrosine yeah. is going to help thyroid as well. So Put that in, in the nutrient category, in the nutrient side. Yep, that yeah. makes sense. This is, and, this is a beautiful thing that people can fix. And the timeline of this, even if you've been tired for 10, 20, 30 years, if you get the proper data, you get all the clinical labs you need, you look at maybe some blood, maybe some stool, urine, that's really all you need. And you can significantly change your life. So I know it's people start to adapt to their illness. 
like because they're so tired, they just don't do sports anymore. They don't go for a walk anymore. They don't go for a run anymore. They don't ride their bike anymore. And slowly but surely, you just turn into a couch potato. And it's not on purpose. It's just you're too damn tired. But you can pull out of it. I mean, I tell the story. I was embarrassed. But I mean, you know, my my last house, you saw how steep my driveway was. Yeah. You know, it goes past the pond down to the mailbox and back up. And I could literally... I could literally feel like I was going to faint sometimes because I had so much combination of everything, but going down to the driveway and back up the steep hill. I mean, my heart's racing. I'm boom, boom, booming. I'm, I'm tired from it. I would like have this post exertional malaise and that's really unmotivating. Like if you're trying to get into fitness and you try to lift or you try to run and you crash for two or three days, that's scary for a lot of people and it just turns them off and they give up completely. So I was there and fortunately I'm, I'm better now. I could just go swimming. Like I have my snorkel on today and just swimming hard, boom, boom, boom. And I'm fine. I feel good. Yeah. Very interesting too. There was a, um, there was an observation that someone made online that was really interesting. I want to see if it adds up, but they were talking about there's a massive deficit of kids hitting driver's age and not getting their driver's license. And it's like, what's going on with this? Where there's just this comfort of like, hey, I can be home. I can play video games. I have my phone. I can be connected to the world technologically. I don't have to get out there and go out there and do things. And so there's this kind of society is kind of uh, causing people to go inward and kind of be reclusive. And this failure to launch thing that's happening. And you see it. I mean, go back to my days of like, I remember like the first day I was eligible to get my, my wheels. You know what I mean? I'm like ready to go so I can get out there and experience the world and, and be and see places, right? Yeah. I mean, I was uh, living in Vegas at the time. I got my permit at 15 and a half. I couldn't wait to get out on the road. It was incredible. Yeah. yeah I've seen that, that you're, you've right. You're right. The, uh, there was a paper on that about these kids where, oh God, it's something where even in their twenties, they're still not having driver's licenses. They're like, whatever, we're going to just stay in mom's basement and just kind of chill. And so, um, you know, this just comes back to like, you know, getting what well, one, having a healthy relationship with technology and Kids, the younger they are, you got to put up those boundaries because that creates a whole level of stress. And that can um, obviously kind of create this culture of poor eating, poor sugar, because we, we the, the nutrition and the gut function is essential for forming healthy brains. We need the good fats. We need the good protein. We need all the nutrients. We need to avoid all the food allergens to really have good, healthy brain function. And that kind of connects back to what we're talking about today. Yep. Yep. All right. Cool. If you need help and uh, you want to reach out clinically, you can do so at our websites. So Dr. J, that's Dr. Justin Marcajani at justinhealth.com, justinhealth.com. You can reach out consults worldwide. So the logistics are do an intake, get some labs run, get some data, make a protocol to get yourself better. So that's the, the long story short of it. Um, me, Evan Brand at evanbrand.com. We're happy to help worldwide. You can also book an intro call with us. So if you want to chat with us, let us know your story, your issues, see if we can help. You can also book those on our site. Absolutely. And then we'll put links down below of some of the supplements that we recommend to kind of help support some of these things. And guys, when you're thinking about this, it's easy to get overwhelmed. Try to find one thing here that you can take action on. And then if you want to dive in deeper, links down below to schedule where we can kind of walk you through everything, hold your hand, um, get the history done, figure out what the big stressors are and kind of co go about this very strategically versus kind of doing everything under the sun. We can have a strategic approach of getting to the root cause of what's happening. Yeah. All right. Good All right. to see you, Excellent. Man. Hey, Evan, great chatting with you. Take care, y'all. Have a good one, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all.